my son, keep your father's commandments and do not forsake the Torah of your mother. Bind them to your heart forever. Tie them around your neck. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Amos 4.12 there actually says, Prepare to meet your Elohim, O Israel. You know, we are the Israel of Yahweh. We are the spiritual Israel. And we have to prepare ourselves. You know, on this first day of Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, this first day and the last day are called High Sabbaths. And I've been impressed to preach on this topic of preparing to meet Yeshua. Should be our number one priority, I believe. Especially in this time that we're living in. We know we're living in the last days. There's not much time for us to get our robes white. To be walking in holiness. We've got to do it now. We can't delay. We're very close to Yeshua's return, and we need to make whatever the adjustments are necessary to get ourselves aligned up with the word of Yahweh, the Bible. <clears throat> Five days ago, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, I spoke on the judgment seat of Messiah, and that was the first time I'd ever taught on that. And there were some things I definitely learned when I was preparing that. And my pre preparation for today's message has also been eye-opening for me in some areas. Most definitely is connected to the judgment seat, but from a slightly different perspective. I do want us to home in on getting ourselves individually ready. I can't get you ready, you can't get me ready. We have to get ourselves individually ready in order to meet Yahweh, Yahshua specifically. We're going to start out here in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, Husbands, love your own wives just as Christ also loved the congregation and gave himself up on her behalf in order that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with a word that he might present her the splendid congregation to himself, not having a blemish or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. We know that Yeshua loves us. After all, we've sung that song, I think, that we sang last Sabbath. You know, Jesus loves me, Yeshua loves me, this I know. I want you to notice what I have underlined there in the, the last of the highlighted area. The phrase, with a word. That word there, the term, would, word there, many times I've heard it used over the years by different ones, Bible teachers and such, thinking that it's logos. You know, the, the Greek word logos, which would refer to the person of Yahshua. But that's not what the word is there. The word is rhema. And it specifically means an utterance, a specific utterance or a specific command. For example, when you receive a specific word from the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, I hope He does to you, He has to me. I'm not special. He speaks to us if we are willing to walk in holiness and we want to talk to Him. You know, kind of like the song says, you know, he walks with me and talks with me. And that's the way it ought to be with every one of us. Back in the year 2012, I received a rhema word from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually asked me a question. Why aren't you obeying the fourth commandment? It was kind of a, what I'd call a question command. <laughs> because I knew what the Holy Spirit was saying. It was time for me to obey the fourth commandment. But that was a rhema word, a specific word, an utterance, a command that the Holy Spirit had given. 
So what I'm saying is that the, the entire Bible, the entire word of Yahweh is when it's clearly laid out on the table, so to speak, we are to obey it. We're not supposed to kind of shuffle around in our mind and weigh the pros and cons and so on. We're to obey it. If we want to be reigning with Yeshua in the kingdom, there's no option except to obey it. There's no option. You know, a lot of people think that word grace, we were singing about that in the uh, Amazing Grace song. And a lot of people think that that word grace means kind of means that, well, God, you know, he, God and I got this, this relationship. He knows me, you know, and he kind of winks. <laughs> no, that's not grace. That's not grace at all. Grace is when he gives you the desire and the power to obey what he says to do. And so when a rhema word is laid out before us, we are to obey it. You know, Yeshua himself gave a rhema word here when he was talking with Satan after when, during the temptation. He said he answered, talking about answering Satan, he said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word, every rhema word coming out of Yahweh's mouth. The Bible has all of the rhema words of Yahweh. That time I told you that the Holy Spirit spoke to me back in the year 2012, he was referring me to a rhema word, the fourth commandment. All the rhema words are in the Bible. Today we're going to be addressing a topic that is very much avoided, it's submission, submission to the rhema word, submission to the Bible. We live in a time where everyone seems to think, well, my way is okay. I don't have to listen. And we do have to listen. We have to pay attention. It says here in Hebrews chapter 13, Obey your leaders and submit, for they keep watch over your souls, as those who must give account, so that they may do it with joy and not with sighing, which would be unprofitable for you. You know, the two words there that are highlighted that we're going to look at today, the rhema words, obedience and submission. And some people, some, even some Christians say, well, I don't need anyone to watch over my soul. I can watch over my own soul. No. No. The Bible says that we have to have leaders, whether it's in the home or whether it's in the assembly to watch over our souls. We need to have things brought to our attention. Have you ever had your toes stepped on? I'm not talking about being in a crowd and someone stepping on your toes, but I'm talking about have you ever had your feathers ruffled by what some preacher says sometimes or your authority? Yeah, we all have. Sometimes we bristle up and get irritated and ticked off and sh try to shake it off and so on, but what does the scripture say right here? It says obey and submit. Sometimes things like this, verses like this, will kind of grate on our nerves. They rub our fur the wrong way. You know what? That's typical. <laughs> that is really typical. Look what it says here in Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Apostle Paul said, all things are permissible for me, but... Not all things are appropriate. All things are permissible for me, but not all things edify. When we desire to do something, we need to run it by Yahweh. I think there's a scripture that says, you know, boast not yourselves of tomorrow, for you know not what a day may bring forth. And uh, making a plan for tomorrow, you know, a person, I'm, I'm, I can't quote it exactly, but we can't just make plans blindly for the future without taking Yahweh into consideration. Is Yahweh directing me in this area? Is he going to be winking at me, you know, that idea, that false idea of grace? Well, I'll let that pass. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. You know, Yahweh doesn't operate that way. We are either right with him or we are wrong with him. There are no other ways with it. 
you may have a, the right to do a lot of things according to our culture that we live in. There are a lot of things that are permissible in our culture, but not all of those things are going to edify. We have to be a good testimony for other people. The way we act, the way we talk, the way we dress, all of these things, other people take into consideration. You know that Christianity is judged by your life and my life. Yahshua is judged by your life and the way that you act and the way I act. We have to take these things into account. The idea that sometimes scripture goes against our grain, it ought to go against our grain. <laughs> it ought to. It ought to go, and it will. It will go against your flesh. It will go against your carnal nature. Yes, you do have a carnal nature. We all do. But we also, if you are born again, you have a spiritual nature. So you have that, so to speak, you, you've kind of, perhaps you've seen a cartoon of it. You know, a, a little white angel sitting on one shoulder and a little devil sitting on the other shoulder. That's not factual, okay? That, that's not factual. But the, the principle of what that little cartoon is showing is that you have a spiritual nature if you're born again, and you have a carnal nature. Which one is going to dominate? I know my dad, he was a pastor, and he used to tell the story of, he said uh, there was a Native American, an Indian chief, actually, that had become converted, and uh, the missionary or whoever it was, the preacher that was uh, talking with him after he became converted, he had been converted for you know maybe a year or something of that nature. And so the, uh, the missionary asked him, he said, well, which way do you go? Do you go the spiritual way or do you go the carnal way? And the Indian said, I can't, I'm not going to talk, I try to talk in broken English. I, I'll do a ter terrible job of it. But, you know, he said, I have, it's like I have two dogs inside of me, a white dog and a black dog. And the one I feed the most is the one that wins. And isn't that the truth? If we are feeding our carnal nature, we will be doing the things that our carnal nature wants to do. If we are feeding our spiritual nature, then we will be doing the things that our spiritual nature should be telling us to do. And just because our carnal nature doesn't like something doesn't mean that we have the excuse to disregard it. There's so many things in the scripture that are going to rub your carnal nature the wrong way. They rub my carnal nature the wrong way. Well, praise Yahweh, I have a spiritual nature. I want to see my spiritual nature win. I've seen some people even during a message, <laughs> maybe they're getting their toes stepped on and they'll pretend like they're going to sleep because they want to ignore <laughs> the rhema words that are being laid out on the table. Now, I'm not trying to say something if anyone is tempted to go to sleep here, but, uh, well, maybe I am. <laughs> we are surrounded by a culture that caters to the flesh caters to carnality. Hollywood, TV, the internet, advertising, fashions, society in general. All of those things cater to the flesh. Every one of those things is under the control of the prince of the power of the air, Satan. Every one of them. And the bottom line in this verse here is that if we permit well, actually, the next verse that I'll show you, okay? Let me read the verse. Galatians 5, 17. For the cravings of the lower, the carnal nature, Paul called it the lower nature, are opposed to those of the spirit. And the cravings of the spirit are opposed to those of the lower nature. Because these are antagonistic to each other, so that you do not do everything to which you are inclined to do. Apostle Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 7. We won't go into that, but he said, the things that I want to do, I don't do. That's because the carnal nature is antagonistic to the spiritual nature. And so the bottom line of this particular scripture here is that if we permit our carnal nature to rule us, then we are going to be at odds 
with the Holy Spirit. We will be at odds with the word of Yahweh. And the bottom line when we are to prepare ourselves to meet Yahweh, to meet specifically Yahshua, is we will not be receiving eternal life. This is a very serious matter for every one of us here. So Hebrews 13, again, 17, says, Obey your leaders and submit, for they keep watch over your souls, as those who must give account, so that they may do it with joy and not sign, which would be unprofitable for you. This word here, obey, simply means comply, just do it. And you don't have to have a good attitude in order to do so. The obedience part doesn't require a good attitude. You can do it with a grumpy attitude. It's not a big deal to do that. You can obey. Remember the perhaps the story of a little boy that was playing in the kitchen back many years ago, probably about the same age, uh, same time that I was a little boy. I'm not saying it was me, but I'm not going to say. And uh, anyway, playing with the pots and pans. Didn't have the internet phone in his hand. Didn't have a cell phone in his hand. He had pots and pans, and he's banging on the pots and pans, and his mommy said to him, Johnny, would you quiet down, please? And so Johnny, it wasn't Daryl now. <laughs> but anyway, so Johnny, he quiets down for a couple of minutes, and then after a while, his little nature takes over. So what's he start doing again? He starts banging on those pots and pans. And so finally, you know how it is when Mama finally uses a middle name? She's dead serious then. So, Johnny, Ray, Smith, I told you to quit playing so loud, you go stand in the corner. And so he gets up, and he stiffens himself, got his fist clenched at his side, and he stalks over there to the corner, and he stands there fuming, you know. <laughs> you ever do that? <laughs> and after a minute or so, he said, Mama, I may be standing up on the outside, but I'm sitting down on the inside. That's exactly. See, he obeyed. He obeyed. But there's a lot of difference between obeying and submitting. You know, I've run across a lot of carnal reasons why people don't have to obey certain things in the Scriptures. Here's a little list. Carnal reasons not to obey spiritual leaders. Well, everyone thinks they're right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, all those Bible teachers on the internet, and y'all, they do. I'll guarantee you they do. They all say they're right. Someone's got to be wrong, right? Oh, that's just his opinion. Or, well, that's, that's not what that scripture means. Or, well, that verse is for the Jews. We're Gentiles. And usually a little shake the head and stick the nose up in the air goes along with that sometimes. Those are carnal reasons. We have to obey the scripture, what it says. The word of Yahweh stands and it cannot be broken. You know, as weak and feeble human beings created by the great Elohim, Yahweh, we can offer, we can attempt to offer all kinds of excuses and all kinds of reasons to not obey. But you know, at the judgment seat of Yeshua, all of those false reasons are going to fall away they will not amount up to one little hill of beans. We will stand naked before Yahshua, says in Hebrews 4.13, no creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And then that idea of submitting. <clears throat> to, mit, to submit means to yield to another one's will. And folks, that's hard. That's the hard one. That is the hard one. And yet it's part of the rhema word that Yahweh gives each one of us. We can pretend to obey, but you cannot fake submission. True submission can't be faked. You, uh, you may obey, on the outside, and you can grumble and complain to others about whatever, because you're not going to be able to fake submission. 
So to submit is to not only to obey, but to obey with a good attitude, and even to obey with joy. Why? Because you'd be obeying Yahweh. Direct orders from Yahweh. With this command to obey and submit to our spiritual authorities, it's a matter of saying, well, even though I think I am right about this particular matter, and you are wrong, I think you're wrong, I will still obey and submit to you. That's what it boils down to, whoever the authority is that Yahweh has placed in our lives. It's a matter of the will. <clears throat> at the judgment, at the judgment seat, can anyone really think that Yeshua is going to say, well, I know that you were right about such and such. I know that. Yeah, I know that. After all, everyone else thinks they're right. So it's okay that you disobeyed my command to obey and submit to your authorities. No. It's exactly as Samuel, the prophet Samuel, told King Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 22. Then Samuel said, this is after King Saul had been instructed to do a specific thing, very specific thing, and he disobeyed it. And so Samuel said to him, does not, or excuse me, does Yahweh take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying Yahweh? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. See, Saul was attempting to make a sacrifice in the place of actual obedience. And he ended up losing the entire kingdom because of his disobedience. So it's a, an important thing for us to do what it says in Hebrews 13, 17. Your spiritual authorities, according to Yahweh, your spiritual authorities have been given the responsibility to watch out for your soul. Scripture states that very clearly. We, we say that sometimes, well, I, I can just do what I want to do. I don't have to listen to that. But the Scripture says otherwise. And if we are wanting to prepare ourselves to meet Yahshua, we've got to do what the Scripture says. I don't think there's any ifs, ands, and buts about it. Your spiritual authority has been given this responsibility by Yahweh to watch out for your soul. You know, Dave and I have talked about this on more than one occasion. It's a heavy responsibility that a pastor has. We watch for the souls of everyone that's in this congregation. That's my responsibility. That's Dave's responsibility. We keep guard we watch out. We're not to do it with a dominating spirit, a dominating attitude. That's contrary to Scripture also. I've been in a church before where that was the case. And that definitely leaves a bad impression on people. Many times it's very difficult, and sometimes it's even distasteful to watch out for the souls of the people in the assembly. But you know, our eternal life depends on obeying the word of Yahweh. There are no commands that any of us can afford to disregard. And what I'm showing you today are the rhema words of Yahweh. Yahweh is looking for humble, obedient servants that will be loyal to him throughout eternity. And faith... The faith that we exercise now is simply undying loyalty and it is to trust and obey Yahweh under any circumstance. Can we afford to say, well, my spiritual authority is wrong about whatever, so I don't need to obey and submit to him? No. We are to obey and submit unless we are, one excuse, unless we are being told to disobey a specific commandment of Yahweh. And even then, we need to tread very lightly and pray that Yahweh will closely guide our motives and actions. You know, the, in the book of Acts, the apostles were told by the, the rulers there, uh, Pharisees, Sadducees, to quit speaking about Yahshua after he had resurrected. And they said, it's better to obey Yahweh than man when it comes to that matter. 
because they were specifically being told to disobey a commandment. But that's the only reason that we can disobey our authority, according to what Scripture definitely says. <clears throat> First area, or the second area, I guess I'd say, that we want to look at here, says in Genesis chapter 2, Yahweh Elohim said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Yahweh created the woman to be a helper for her husband. She is not inferior. No. The woman is not inferior. She is not to be treated as some kind of a lesser person. I know several women who are probably more intelligent than their husband. Probably mine is. But that's not the issue here. I know several women that have more Bible knowledge than their husband. But that's not the issue. Husbands are not superior and wives are not inferior. But the wife's role was established by Yahweh and that is for her to be the helper in the marriage. The help meet is the way it puts it in the King James Bible, I believe. I'll guarantee you. Now, we, we don't have very many younger people here, but this particular issue right here has got to be discussed before you get married to someone. When you find someone that you are attracted to and such, you need to find out if they are willing to do what the Scripture says. Because if they're not, don't get married to the person. <laughs> It's as simple as that. It's a lot harder, folks, after marriage, after marriage has already been consummated and so on, to change after that point in time. Is change impossible? No. But it's going to take a revelation from Yahweh to make that. It says in 1 Corinthians 11.3, Paul said, but I would have you to know that <clears throat> the head of every man is Messiah and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Messiah is Yahweh. Again, these things have to be discussed before marriage happens. But you know, even what if you come out of the darkness into the light after you have been married? Well, need to have a sit down talk together about these things. We're all under authority. The man is the head of the home. And folks, these are not antiquated instructions. These are not irrelevant instructions. This is for today, and we are to be obedient to this command if we want to be ready to meet our bridegroom, Yeshua. <clears throat> Look what the Apostle Paul says here in 1 Timothy. So I desire that the men in every place pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Similarly, the women also dressing themselves in appropriate clothing with modesty and good sense, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works, which is appropriate to women who pro profess godliness. Let a woman learn in silence in full subordination. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Also, Adam was not deceived. Rather, the woman being deceived became a transgressor. The highlighted area there is fo focusing on the clothing. That's what I want to look at. The reason being, folks, we live in such a carnal, carnal time. You know, if you've ever read through the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and if you ever have looked at any history, you would know that the city of Corinth was about the way that much of the United States is today. Nudity, debauchery, those are things that were common in Corinth, and they are definitely common here in the United States of America. Are these just suggestions? Is it, is it okay for us to just dress like the culture around us dresses? 
those who attempt to minimize scriptures, particularly that deal with a woman's place in the home or the assembly, are going to be definitely tempted to minimize something like this. But I would ask, what's going to be the norm during the millennial kingdom? Now think about that. Here, I think most of us here probably desire to get eternal life and then rule and reign with Yahshua. I think that's what most of us want here. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I believe that that would be a, almost a universal thing within this congregation today. If we are going to do that, if we're actually going to receive the gift of eternal life and be permitted to reign with him, then we have to disassociate ourselves from the current culture that is around us. We have to disassociate ourselves from those religions that are around us. During the kingdom, the ladies that are going to be ruling with Yeshua are all going to have a unified teaching on this matter. And it's going to be what this scripture says right here. This is the Bible. This is the, these are the rhema words of Yahweh. And those are the things I believe that women will be teaching those other women in the kingdom. The ones that are ruling are going to be teaching what the Bible says to other women and girls. There's not going to be any personal opinions. There will be absolute loyalty to Yahweh, Yahshua in particular. So we need to get this right in our lifetimes. I am not one to mandate this or that. You never hear me make up ten rules of whatever. That goes against my fur. I was in that environment for quite a few years in my life. That's not my place. I'm to lay the word of Yahweh out for you and let the Holy Spirit speak to your hearts. Women, including daughters, are to dress in appropriate clothing with modesty and good sense. That goes right along with that scripture. A married woman may dress seduct seductively for her husband while in the privacy of their own home, but seductive dress has no place outside. A Christian man, a Christian woman has no place to be at a public swimming pool or a beach. Can any one of us really think that being around the opposite sex who are in various stages of nudity at a public beach or swimming pool you think that's okay, really? Can you really think it's okay for a woman to wear things that show a lot of their skin? No. Now, I'm being pretty blunt. I know that. But you know, it seems like there's a lot of women that do not understand the workings of the man's mind. Remember the book that was out back probably oh, 30, 40 years ago, Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus, or perhaps it's the other way around. I don't remember. And men, men don't understand the way women think. I'm sorry, I don't. I'm learning. I'm not so much in the dark as I was 35 years ago when I married my wonderful wife. And, uh, you know, we have great compatibility, but... I'll guarantee you that a man's mind is a mystery to most women. When it comes to this matter, men are sight-oriented. That's the way Yahweh has created us, okay? That is the way Yahweh has created us. Now, I'm not saying that Yahweh has created us as lustful men. There's a difference between being sight-oriented and being lustful. Lust is sin, and we are just sight-oriented. You mothers need to teach your daughters these things. And I've heard some women say, well, that's a man's problem. No, it ain't. No, it's not. A woman cannot be dressed seductively, fleshly, in a fleshly way, and then just pawn that blame off on a man if he has lustful thoughts. Now, a Christian man should be disciplining himself so that he is not 
looking at those things, avoiding those things. That's what we are to do. But if you have someone parading around and showing a lot of skin and their nudity and so on, you are placing an unnecessary temptation in front of man. Guaranteed. A true Christian man is definitely responsible for his thoughts. You know, my wife and I were talking about this just a couple days ago. You know that up until approximately 100 years ago, a woman usually would not even show her ankle. It was considered lustful for a woman to show her ankle in public. Now, that sure has gone by the wayside. And I'm not saying that we ought to return to that, but, you know, it would sure do away with a lot of the lust problems, wouldn't it, if women were covering up all the way down to their ankles. <clears throat> when I was an educator in the a Christian educator in the uh, system in Little Rock, there was a dress code that the girls had in some of the schools, not our school, but some of the schools. They had to wear a skirt that was down to the mid-calf, you know, below the knee, mid-calf. And so they would do that, but they would wear it really, really tight. Some of them would, not all of them, but some of them would. It would kind of negate the, the modesty factor. I mean, the long skirt was meant to per portray modesty, and yet the girls, some of the girls would be wearing it so tight that they were still drawing attention to their, their bodies. It kind of destroyed the, uh, the, definitely the spirit of the law. They were obeying the letter of the law, but they were not obeying the spirit of the law. <clears throat> I know that a lot of times girls want the attention of a man. Women sometimes want the attention of men in general. But doing that with a carnal dress or undress is definitely not the way to do it. You're getting the kind of attention you don't want. You may think you want it, but I'll guarantee you really don't want it. To emphasize a girl's or a woman's figure with tight clothing, low-cut clothing, or short clothing, does nothing but draw the eyes of a man. And the world calls that eye candy. And that's code word for look and lust. Ladies, men are side oriented. It's the way Yahweh has created us. And a man, whether young or old, very much is going to notice the clothing and the shape of women and young ladies. You ladies would probably be shocked if you were to see the thoughts of a typical male who sees a female wearing tight clothing or not much clothing at all. Well, during the kingdom, those ladies that will be reigning with Yeshua will all be teaching about modesty. And what I've read to you today will definitely be a part of that. La lastly, in this area of submission and obedience, we're going to talk to husbands. Back in Ephesians again, it says, Husbands, love your own wives just as Messiah also loved the congregation and gave himself up on her behalf in order that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with a word, that he might present her himself, not having a blemish or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that she be holy and blameless. You see what's being said here? It says, love your wives as Yeshua loved the assembly. He cleanses us. Yeshua cleanses us with the rhema words so that we will not have spots and wrinkles in our robe of righteousness. That's a pastor's responsibility to bring you the rhema word. And men, it is our responsibility as husbands with our wives. That's the same responsibility. We are to purify our wives. You don't purify her with beating her up. We must talk about these things in a marriage that I'm presenting to you. You cannot afford to neglect this matter. Our eternal life depends on it. If we, as husbands, just ignore this, then we will be held accountable for disobeying this scripture. It is our responsibility to be able to present our wives to Yahshua holy 
and blameless, exactly as Yahshua will do with the assembly. It's a husband's responsibility to do that. It's, this is a heavy duty responsibility. <clears throat> says there, husbands love your wives. That's agape. Even as Messiah loved the congregation and gave, gave himself up on his behalf. That word agape, that agape type of love, it's not phileo. You've got two different kinds of love in the Bible. One's phileo and one's agape. We are asked to do both of those things, but agape is the primary one. Agape is chiefly of the heart. It's unconditional. It's an act of your will. Whereas phileo is based on attraction. It's based on emotion and feelings. And it is conditional. <clears throat> you can uh, fall out of phileo love. You can't fall out of agape love. That's an important thing for us to know. If we are loving our wives as we ought, agape love, you're not going to fall out of love. Peter expands on this. Look what he says. 1 Peter 3, 7. And you husbands, likewise, dwell with your wives according to knowledge and hold them in honor as the weaker vessels because they also will inherit with you the gift of eternal life, so that your prayers not be hindered. This is a powerful scripture, folks. This is powerful. Men ought to honor their wives. We've already discussed some of the responsibilities of a wife, but I want you to notice that this agape love command is only given to the husband. It's not given to the wife. Do you think that's strange? If a man loves his wife and does, as the scripture says, with his wife, his wife will be attracted to him, and she will want to love him back. That's what happens. But if a man is not operating according to scripture, then she will have a spirit of rejection within her. That's a human response. I'm not saying it's spiritual, but it's a human response. <clears throat> If you love her correctly, she will love you back. If you honor her correctly, she will love you back. She was created as the weaker of you two, and so husbands are to honor their wives and hold them as the weaker vessel. And notice it says, because they will also inherit with you the gift of eternal life. Now let that sink in. The gift of eternal life is hanging in the balance here for the husband and the wife. Now, unless a wife, if, let's say that a husband is, is not operating according to the scripture here, unless the wife is extremely submissive, she will miss out, along with the husband, on eternal life. It's because of the disobedience of some husbands regarding this command that many wives do show some degree of resistance and rebellion toward the husband. Like I said, I'm not saying it's right, but it's a natural human response. It naturally is going to happen. It's part of the carnal nature, I'll be honest with you. That's what it is. But, you know, we, we all, I'll guarantee you there's not a person in this building that operates according to the spiritual nature 100% of the time. We all slip off into carnality at times. It's something we have to repent of and get back on track. But we don't want to be operating in carnality. That is, can be a fatal thing, <clears throat> particularly when it comes, like I'm talking about, with a marriage. A husband, <clears throat> excuse me, Husband cannot micromanage his wife. Husband cannot enforce obedience and submission. You cannot do that. Those are things that have got to be talked about before you get married. You don't base a marriage on someone's looks, their figure. Yes, that's being done today, 
you and I both know that's the case. It's really a pretty stupid reason to marry someone. You know, uh, there's a saying, you know, you've heard it, beauty is skin deep. Beauty is skin deep, skin deep, character goes to the bone, and spirituality goes to the heart. You want a spiritually minded spouse, whether it's male or female. You want to be on the same page. These are important things we're talking about. You can't, a man can't be coming home and sitting down at the table after he finishes work and have a knife and a fork in each hand and pound on the table and say, Woman, where's my food? That is so immature. <laughs> that is so immature. I, he may do it jokingly. Okay, I'll give that. But to, for guys to honestly be doing that, that's a pretty immature thing. That's a ditch on one side of the road. What's a ditch on the other side of the road, guys? Just to have a laissez-faire attitude. Just whatever will be, will be. I just let my wife just do whatever she wants, whatever she wants to do. That's fine to me. No, it's not. <laughs> not scripturally. You've got to talk about these things. You've got to have communication. It takes communication to do this. It will lead to unwarranted stress in her life. If, if a man has the attitude, I just let my wife do what she wants. She wants a job, I'll let her have a job. If she doesn't want a job, that's fine. Guard your wife. Protect your wife. That's your responsibility, men. Make sure that your wife is not taking too much on her. This is the thing that has been that the Holy Spirit really spoke to me about in this message, preparing this message. I don't want my wife to be taking on too much. It's easy for my wife to take on too much regarding the cooking and such for the assembly here. You know that stress that it puts on her? Stress on, a, on anyone could be a fatal thing. I'm talking about just physically, it can be fatal. But it also brings stress in a marriage. We're responsible for these things, men. The primary responsibility is on the shoulders of every one of us as husbands that are husbands. So we are to agape love our wives. Hold them in honor. Always recognize that they are the weaker. Protect her. Guide her from taking up too much. Don't throw it up in her face that, well, you're the weaker vessel. No, that, that's in yeah. Keep it in your mind. You were created man as the stronger of the two. And you were your responsibility, as mine is, is to protect our wives and hold them in honor. <clears throat> Sometimes a wife has what I call a superwoman attitude. I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. Don't let her. <laughs> hold her back. Guard her so that she doesn't do too much. Our wives, men, our wives are the second priority in our lives. Yahweh is number one, and our wives are number two, and your children are number three. Don't get the orders reversed on those. This is a, there's a great deal of responsibility for both spouses in a marriage. Marriage is not a simple thing. It is not a simple thing. It's not just, oh, I like the way that woman looks, or I like the way that man looks. I think I want to get married. Uh, that's pretty stupid. <laughs> we must teach our sons and our daughters these things so that they will be prepared and choose wisely. We're living in such a time of debauchery. It's even more important now, I think, than perhaps it was years ago. It might have been a, a, a little more simple thing years ago. It's not now because of what's going on in the culture and society around us. There's a time of great sexual temptation. Our children are being exposed to things that were mostly hidden 50 years ago. A true Christian man and woman are there to walk in holiness, avoid the appearance of evil, and I'm drawing our attention to this matter of preparing ourselves to meet Yeshua. Again, the number one priority in our lives. Many of us are in a marriage, and we are to do right. There are, are eternal consequences to our actions. 
And we cannot say, well, I'll get it right when Yeshua gets back. No. It'll be too late, folks. There's no repentance at the judgment seat. It's got to happen now where we, while we are breathing, while we are alive in this lifetime. <clears throat> we are to serve Yahweh with all of our hearts. Do you know that to obey the commandments, to come here for the assembly like on a holy day, is serving Yahweh. Did you know that? You are serving Yahweh by being here. It says in Romans 12, 1, Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Yahweh, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Yahweh. This is your spiritual worship. We present ourselves to Yahweh and His Word in obedience and submission. The society, society of this world says that your body belongs to you. No. Your body belongs to Yahweh. Therefore, we are to glorify Him with our bodies. We are to glorify Him with how we dress. We are serving the King of Kings. I am serving the King of Kings by preaching to you today. Dave will be serving the King of Kings by preaching to you all the rest of the messages throughout this Feast of Tabernacles. We are serving the Creator. Everything that we do, whether it's songs, setting up tables, sitting down, listening, talking, we are serving the King of Kings. And we must keep that in the forefront of our minds. Yesterday was a preparation day. Tomorrow is a preparation day also for a weekly Sabbath. Yesterday was a preparation day for this high Sabbath. On a preparation day is when I write most of my sermons out. I prepare for the Sabbath. I go to bed at a reasonable hour so I will be alert. My wife and I have our Sabbath clothing. We know what we're going to wear. We're trying to glorify the King of Kings with what we do. That's our desire. We are to present ourselves to Yahweh for appropriate worship appropriate service. We are to submit to the Yahweh and His rhema word. Anything less is disobedience. So be a Berean. This is the first high Sabbath day of Sukkot, and we will have seven more days after today. I'm looking forward to hear my good brother, Dave Andrewlis, to be expounding the word to us. And until then, Shabbat Shalom. Larry, would you close in prayer?